Welcome to Table Talk, the weekly variety show where we explore tabletop games and hobby-related topics. I'm Chase from On The Table Gaming, and I'm joined, of course, by my co-host, Simon. Uh, you know, you're a man of many talents. At the end of the show, you're going to be showing us how to make some LED lightsabers. So, everyone, make sure you stick around for that. And, uh, Simon, what did we cover last week? Well, Chase, you're too kind. You know, we've, um, <laughs> this is our third show, I believe, and yeah. uh, we've had some fantastic feedback. Last week, uh, we talked a little bit more generally about things which are of interest. We covered some 3D printing sort of topics, including Loot Studios, who've got some fantastic miniatures. And we were lucky to sit down with our first part of the interview with Andy Hobday, where we talked about, a little bit about his history, some of the earlier projects that he's worked on, leading up to the Barons' War, which I believe we're covering today in the second part of the interview. And so we're going to get a good blend of content today where we talk about Star Wars Legion. We talk about the Baratheon update preview for A Song of Ice and Fire, the miniatures game. We've got Andy Hobday from Baron's War. And then we're going to see how to assemble a Star Wars Legion lightsaber with an actual LED component. It's a pretty mystifying thing, and Simon's done a great job of kind of breaking it down so it's not so challenging. So stay tuned. we got a lot in store for today. Yep, let's shut up and let's get to the content. All right, so let's jump in. We had another Visions in the Flames. Now, this is the ninth release from uh, Simon, and uh, we covered this with actually the game designer on our most recent podcast, the Visions in the Flame podcast. So head on over to On the Table Gaming and check out our podcast to catch up on what the designer's thoughts were. But Simon, let's just kind of jump in here and just give a quick um, you know, gut reaction to some of the things we're seeing here and... So for Baratheons, the biggest thing revealed here, not only are two commanders, but also the Tactus cards. So let's flip over and take a look and see what those Tactus cards look like. Absolutely. I think for me, as a, I, when the Baratheon set came out, I did get it on the table for a little while. I um, played a few <laughs> games, not too many. Um, but one thing which I found frustrating and something I know that you've talked about, Chase, is um, the interaction of the Tactus cards and the opportunity to use them. Right. And so that was a, a thing where... I think Michael Chanel kind of got into a little bit about um, the idea was you have all these options, but they, they do have a cost, right? And so in the original deck that we saw, there were actually, I think, five cards that had overlapping triggers. So yeah. there was three for one uh, trigger word and two for the other. And so the idea was that the situation might arise. Maybe it's that you get hit and your unit's engaged. And then you could choose some options like, okay, what do I want to do here? Um, but what in actuality kind of happened was instead of it being like, oh, I feel like I've got all this choice, it actually turned into a situation where maybe players felt like, oh, they were losing out. And they're like, oh, I can only do one of these things, not that I can do all of these things. And so yeah. it actually turned it into a little bit of a, a feels bad moment. So I think so. I think a clever opponent could actually um, strategize there as well. And understanding that restriction make it very difficult for a Baratheon player to be successful. Right. And so, you know, they've gone and done a pass on these and uh, these have been mentioned as being some of the most changed tactics cards. So um, it kind of gives us kind of the idea of the scope of these changes. Mm. Um, but overall, I think, you know, honestly, there's not much to dislike here. Uh, I think these cards are all great and yeah, it just I maybe can't... changes. It doesn't change the identity, but it goes from like, you hit me, we do this to kind of like you do a number of things to us and we do this back to you. I can't imagine one player saying I preferred the previous version of these cards. I don't know, unless they had a list which worked really well with them. I think these are across the board an improvement. Um, one thing which is um, a, a sort of a narrative throughout the whole update for 2021 is the fact that free actions are going away. Mm -hmm. And this really talks to that in terms of the design. But I don't think it's lost any of the fun or potentially right. the, the, the tactical stuff when you're actually playing. And I think if we go down and look at the commanders that they revealed, we see another example of how they really keep still within the theme. And there are some tweaks. You know, for example, Stannis is losing his Sundering and his, uh, you know, invulnerability to conditions. But mm. he's still all about condition play. And so adaptive planning, mark target, those things work well in a very compelling manner. And it lets you kind of use uh, essential components of the game, which is tokens, more. And I think that just like it reinforces the things that make the game great. I completely agree, especially with the tokens, because both players have a say in that. Mm -hmm. And so um, you're making a, like a quantitative decision based on if you put a token there and then if your opponent values it enough, they remove it. Um, I think this is really cool. And when we're seeing the tactics cards really talk to the core mechanics of the game, it's a much stronger experience. I'm really happy with this update. Yeah. I've really looked at Stannis' cards. I really haven't looked at Renly's because I have no interest in Renly. I'm a Team Stannis <laughs> guy all the way. So uh, maybe you want to speak on Renly yeah. now? So as the Renly fan fanboy here, we were a split. You know, I, I love 
love how they are doubling down on theme. And, you know, there's been some changes here. Uh, but, you know, Michael Chanel spoke to how Renly as a character is somewhat similar to Jamie Lannister, but instead of kind of buffing his own unit, like the rest of the army looks to him. And so Renly has some really cool, broader tactics cards. What is it? Wealth and Charisma, which lets you remove tokens from each friendly combat unit. That's fantastic. Mm. You know, maybe not as powerful as you might be thinking because... You know, one of the one of the times in the game when you're going to have like every unit in your army having three condition tokens on it, especially if your opponent's playing into you, they know that you can do that. Yep. They're going to be expending those pretty early. But, it, you know, it's still kind of a cool way to have Renly inspiring his troops and bringing everyone to, together. And then even some of the ones that just give you like plus one attack, um, that's a, a rarer effect. And so, you know, being able to do that and have that extra damage, that's pretty significant. Uh, and mm-hmm. I know some people are looking at the cards and being like, well, you know, is Younger Boulder, Farmer more comely, like, is it that great? And it's like, well, actually, yeah, because the way things have scaled, the power curve has sort of shifted. It's still in the really useful range. And you can always, uh, you know, pitch the card at the start of a friendly turn and draw new tactics cards if you want. And those dual trigger cards now, being kind of a core part of the game, that's just, I think so good and it, it really helps you know the game keep flowing and the taxes cards be going in your hand and so you're actually mm-hmm. engaging with the parts of the game that are the enjoyable parts the fun parts so there's no dead cards anymore yeah you know just look at one extra attack dice that can be the difference between when fighting against a defensive unit completely whiffing it or triggering a panic test yes. which has then has other uh, consequences as well so um you know, I'm going to go on record right now and say that we, we look at a lot of different games and you know, get diff- different levels of involved into them. But whenever we look at song, we look at the tactics cards, we look at the commanders, we look at the units. They're so thematic. They really do match the character, the tone we see in the books, um, that it, it really is a, a fantastic experience. And this is why people love the game so mm-hmm. much. It's done with a great uh, deal of care um, and, and attention to make sure we match exactly what, what we feel these characters would do. Anything from, you know, Stannis all the way to Tyrion and people like that. So um, this is this is what we love and we're just getting more of it. And this is going to be really clean moving into 2021. I think that's really what 2021 has showcased is that this is not only really compelling gameplay changes, but also that it was done with care to the theme, um, you know, I, you know, I'm a fanboy, but really, you know, there's not much no, to, really? to, to dislike here. Yeah, right. You know, we've made some content, you know, we'll just put it out there. Exactly. Um, but yeah, I, no, it sort of restores yeah. faith. You know what I mean? Like, you're just like, it's just so nourishing to be like, oh, this is moving in like such a positive direction. Yeah. It, there's a, it's been a long wait, but like, you know, it, it's going to be worth the wait, it seems. So that, that kind of is a good trade off. Right. Yeah, I agree. Looking forward to this one. And speaking of some interesting stuff coming up, we had some cool news coming out of Atomic Mass Games. So let's talk a little about what's coming to the world of Star Wars. All right, so Simon, we just had the AMG, the Atomic Mass Games, big announcement of their transition to now kind of being in charge of the Star Wars properties that used to be owned by FFG. Um, Were you able to catch the stream? Yes, I caught it on the recording. I didn't watch it live. Um, And there's certainly a lot of comments. It generated a lot of interest from the community. Yeah, that was really an interesting one for me, too. And I think that's it hit like a theme that is actually kind of like the quintessential like Disney Star Wars feeling for me where um, I've had a hard time like kind of managing my expectations. It's it's something I'm like, I realize I'm like such a passionate fan about that sometimes my expectations can get set like a little too high. And it maybe sometimes things might struggle to meet those. Um, right. And I, I kind of had a little bit of trepidation at first when I heard that things were shifting from FFG to Atomic Mass Games. Um, not because like Atomic Mass Games isn't capable, like they're doing a great job with Marvel Crisis Protocol, um, but just because I get like nervous when I hear that things are just changing in general and it's it's going to like you know be possibly different. It's in in the hands of somebody new. So I think I had a lot of expectations on this this broadcast to um, make me feel better, right? Like you know, give me a, a, a certain feeling. I think you've hit the nail on the head. Um... Whenever there's change, people fear change to a certain degree. And this is not news to anyone who listens to the you know shows like this. <laughs> Games happen all the time. They change. And, and people take the news both positively and negatively. And it's really how you approach that subject. Now, because of the nature of the transition away from FFG to Atomic Mass Games, then obviously there was some concern there. Because initially, I think we got a couple of um, articles which goes, went into a, a small amount of detail um, it was obvious from the community reaction that it did impact certain individuals at FFG as well. And I know right. that wasn't popular, um, hitting both organized play and obviously the game design departments for, the, for Star Wars Legion. 
Now, what happens is that when that type of stuff happens is and eventually you need to say something. And I felt that what happened um, this week with AMG was their attempt to reach out to the community and make that first contact. It kind of needed to happen at some point. Um, and so they were keen to get in front of their community and start basically being advocates of the game and sharing their passion for what they do. Yeah, exactly. And I think one thing that came across is that um, I think they are fans just like us. Like that came across. Like I felt like, man, like we're, we're kind mm -hmm. of on that same energy level um there were some you know rough edges i think on the presentation which maybe caught me off guard a little bit uh, i to be fair i hadn't tuned into a lot of atomic mass game streams so this is kind of my mm -hmm. first introduction into um how they publicize things and and how they kind of interact with the community and it was like very casual very uh i guess relatable would be the word i'd say mm -hmm. um but at the same time it did kind of leave me something you know wanting for something more and i, I might be comparing like apples and oranges here i think because in my mind, when I think of like Star Wars Legion, I'm always thinking of like FFG's like in-flight reports. And those are like kind of like big Gen Con productions. Um, but there's a certain like style to it. Um, and, you know, we're in a pandemic. This is a different year. Um, but it was a really, really casual stream. And so that was like both a plus and I felt like it maybe caught me off guard at first. Yeah. I've, I've, so there's a distinction to be made. And let's talk about the industry as a whole rather than just specifically about Atomic Mass Games. Um, obviously this pandemic has caused a lot of businesses to have to need to shift mm -hmm. to work differently, to be successful. And one thing which is apparent is that they need to find the audience and communicate clearly with them. And so organizations as a whole should prepare their staff to be, um, presentable on screen, to have all right. the assets that they need and to hide, have this high production value because people demand it. You have to remember. You put something out on the internet, it stays on the internet. And there's no <laughs> taking it back. And, you know, we, we try our hardest, you know, right. to, to make it work. And we're absolutely not perfect. We understand those struggles. Now, for me, for an IP of the scale of Star Wars, to be honest, I was expecting more. And I, I'm not going to say that, um, you know, what, what was presented to us was bad in any way, but I was hopeful there would be more. Right. Um, I was very aware that potentially there wouldn't be any big announcements because it wouldn't make sense right. to do it now, you know? So that will come when maybe there's a, a larger uh, sort of a, uh, outreach to the community. So um, setting the expectations ahead of these types of events would help so much without people understanding the tone and being able to get more positive feedback. When people don't know what they're getting, then they're going to react negatively to it. And I saw some fairly hurtful comments in the chat, which I thought was grossly unfair. Um, but like I said, this is it's not down to individuals. This is an organization level. And my hope is that organizations can now see that they need to promote and to empower their employees to give that professional touch, which people really need to see. Yeah. You know, I think I, I definitely saw some comments you were making that were um unfair i think mm. um but at the same time there was like a twinge of like i did have like an initial feeling where i was like oh wait a second like what's going on um and uh it kind of was like a my quintessential like love hate star wars relationship with like the whole franchise right where like sometimes you go in and for me i was a big fan of rogue one and i was just like at that time i kind of been beaten down a little bit and i had very low expectations right. and i was like that actually felt star wars -y. Um, yes. whereas other times you go and you're like, this is going to uh, 40 years and it's wrapping up now. And like, mm -hmm. how do you meet that hype? Um, and you know, now on the, on the, on the back end of it, like, yeah, like what, what can they really show at this time? What, what could they do? They, they have their hands tied in a lot of ways as far as yeah. like content wise. I, I think so. And I think inevitably what you're seeing, the way that a lot of games work is they work on like an 18 month to two year pipeline right. for content for models everything really takes a while for it to actually appear in the wild so um we're seeing the fruits of the labor from the ffg team um, inevitably going into next year um, they mentioned that they're going to start rebranding the, the boxes initially um i think we'll probably start seeing some more of the amg uh, sort of spin on this particular game but my, i did hear that there were delays i i just hope they're not um stretching out the release schedule to accommodate this year so next year they can move into action because I think the game deserves more. Right. I think people are hungry to have more. And I think the vehicles that we saw were certainly a step in the right direction, but you just have to look through comments and threads through the game that people want all these different Jedi characters. There's so much they really would like to explore. And, um, I, you know, we've got shows like the Mandalorian, 
which right. hasn't even been covered yet. And even yeah. the sequel, you know, and so there's a tremendous a wealth of content out there. So um, I'm hopeful that we see the game expand into those areas, hopefully next year, maybe before, but let's see. And so I know they did mention between March 18th and March 20th, they're going to do four days with just like a ton of streaming all related to Atomic Mass game. And so Mm -hmm. that's going to be a chance for them to talk and show off some of the art, the development process. Um, You know, it's not a a convention specific thing. It's just something they're doing. And they did say that, you know, that their stream was a sneak peek of that sort of stuff. And so maybe they're kind of holding some of the big things, you know, to reveal, but also maybe some of the production elements or quality, like maybe that's going to be kind of a different thing there. Um, I, I think you're right. These these people are, are not new to this industry and they understand this very well about releasing product and creating hype. And I'm sure that they've held a few cards back. So when the time's right, they're going to put stuff out there, which hopefully blows people's hair back and they get really excited about the game. And I think uh, it was Simone Elliott um, and uh, Will Schick that were running it. And uh, one thing I, I initially caught me off guard, but then I, I kind of, once I got to warm up to them a bit, um, you know, they're very honest, right? And so mm-hmm. that sort of, you know, sense of humor and being like, you know, hey, I didn't know what we're spoiling today. And like joking at first when they said that, I was like, wait, what? Like, but then as I went through more of the presentation, I was like, oh, okay, they're, this is sort of their level of humor and how they approach things. And you got a little bit more of the personality. Um, so it was, it was something you kind of you had to warm up to as it went through. But, yeah. you know, let's talk about some of the releases that we, we know about then. So, you know, let's start off with uh, Star Wars Legion, just because that's a game that I'm uh, well invested into. We've got a great crew here. So shout out to Sarge's Rebels and all the guys at Sarge's Comics in New London. And, uh, you know, we've been messaging, just like kind of lamenting that we haven't been able to get together and play in a while. And so we saw um, the AA5 speeder truck, which is like a cool repulsor uh, vehicle that you can actually like open up. And for some reason, that just reminded me of like the old like Kenner, like uh, the actual like toys that you could get for, uh, for like the original trilogy um it just looks like a an actual not like a miniature but like a toy you'd get like the kind of the box you take off the top and look inside absolutely i i, I think that toy aesthetic quality for that vehicle that was good and bad for me because a i thought it looked really good you can open it up and do some things but right. b you're looking at something which is orders of magnitude more expensive than the toys That's... potentially which you could have previously. <laughs> that so, is true. You, know, you look at this thinking, well, how much is this thing going to cost? Because when I was a kid, you know, I could maybe get this as a birthday gift, but now I have to save up for it. I don't know. So we'll wait and see what the price points look yeah, like. Yeah, and then that's all coming out, was it May 20th, all of these mm-hmm. Legion things. So maybe we'll get more more news on prices. Um, but it's like kind of one of those moments in the stream when they're like, here it is. And they're like, you open it with like, ooh, ah. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> Um, you know, I, I could see my miniatures being in there. And yeah. what, what I don't want to be is the guy who's like, do, 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 with the miniatures, you know, sort of if, like playing if with If you them. don't make the sound effects, it, you know, yeah. they don't roll well. Come on, man. You're gonna... And I know you've got a bevy of sound effects, Chase. So no. here's your opportunity to put them on top of our uh, live stream. There we go. <laughs> and uh, the, one of the funny things is I've got a guy, Chris Champion, at our local store who does like crazy conversions. And so he's got like an Imperial army where everybody's got like a mace or a sword or a hammer. He's like converted Darth Vader as like, pikachu with like a pokemon mm. ball but i just know the this aa5 speeder truck we're gonna have like a, a rebel like trucker themed army now that i'm sure he's gonna have a, a field day with so it'll be here's my here's my challenge to him then make that the scooby-doo van the <gasps> magical mystery uh what simon, it was simon uh, what have you done <laughs> what have you done with <laughs> chewbacca can be uh scooby. George? Scooby. <laughs> Oh, my gosh. So a cool Rebel vehicle there. And then we got the LAAT, uh, the Low Altitude Assault Transport. And this is maybe one of the ones when I first heard it uh, was coming. And it had been kind of leaked or spoiled earlier, but we got to see it kind of like up close now. Um, hmm. You know, you immediately think of the, the the Grand Army of the Republic version where it's like flying around shooting lasers. This is actually the smaller light version, which is like the Imperial Patrol Transport version. Uh, yeah. So that one was pretty common in the Rebel series. Also looks pretty cool and interesting to see some, you know, some really uh, different styled vehicles coming to Legion. Yeah, I think the variation is really key for this type of game because you have a whole bunch of stormtroopers, a whole bunch of clones or clankers or whatever, and they all look very, very similar. Right. So by introducing these, it really gives a, a much more sort of punch on the tabletop. And I'm glad that they do it. Um, we haven't seen any rules, any cards, any interactions at the moment. So, um, but I think there'd be some cool things. Typically, when we see this type of release, there's some sort of key benefits to gameplay. And I think that people hopefully will enjoy that. And things starting to crack open a little bit here, right? I think we've, in the, especially this year, like the games really evolved, flaw cards, etc. cetera. Mm. Um, so we'll see where that where it takes things. There was one comment, actually, and this is something we discussed offline, but um, 
AMG coming at this from being a miniatures first company. What did you think of that? Oh man. So I'm going to be completely honest here. Um, that came early enough in the presentation that when they said it, I was still kind of adapting to the style and like kind of catching my emotional grounding first. Mm. Um, and so uh, it didn't land in the way maybe that was intended. <laughs> mm. um, yeah. Yeah, I agree. You know, um, I, I thought it was, it's noble that they care about the quality of the miniatures. And I think that was the intent of the comment. But then, you know, you, we've seen this from Games Workshop from a number of years. And that's been like the unofficial creed of Games Workshop, that they care about the miniatures and the mm -hmm. rules are maybe secondary. And I don't think this is what was meant by that comment. Um, but they also have to bear in mind that um, what we see is an 18 month lead time for miniatures to get to the tabletop. Compare that against some of these unofficial 3D prints, which, to be honest, happened days, yeah. if not weeks, after Heck. the release of uh, online. And these are very, very available. And right. I think this is what we're going to see as the shift of the industry, potentially, moving into the next five or so years, that self-service and being people being able to print stuff at home, I think that might be transformative to what we see on the tabletop. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think... Um to i'm trying to think how to uh, encapsulate my feelings here but like star wars legion the miniatures are great M most of the miniatures are great um but it's also just you know it's in being in the star wars universe and i i really like the rules and i like the mechanics and i think yep. they're so tight um i wouldn't say that i play star wars legion for the miniatures first um it's the star wars experience and that comes with some of the glitz and glam of having it be packaged as a you know a star wars product with cool effects and, and things like that um yep. So, you know, that's kind of the magic to me. I guess, you know, the hard part is like, you know, you come with such unreasonable expectations. Like I don't see a new Games Workshop thing or a uh, Song of Ice and Fire thing and be like, I want it to make me feel like I did when I was a kid. Like that's like such an unfair expectation. I don't mm. throw that on them. Although actually Warhammer, I think maybe it was kind of built into its own universe that is almost comparable to Star Wars. So maybe actually there's a little bit of that. Um, mm. But I think my expectations are just like so much higher for anything Star Wars. Uh, and so that may maybe isn't always fair. So I try to be as charitable as possible. Um, yeah, I think it really hits that emotional note with a lot of people. The, the way that, you know, as a kid, you can remember feeling upset and wanting to cry and happiness right. and just running around the playground and stuff like that. And uh, I've got plenty of stories about playground games. Uh, oh. <laughs> That's a whole other segment here. Which we'll <laughs> hopefully get to when the time's right. But um, yeah, so uh, yeah, I, I think that people have high standards for Star Wars. Yeah. I think it's fair the community demand that. And I look forward to see what AMG have for us this year, moving into next year, maybe with some new experiences and some new games. And then for X-Wing, they revealed uh, Harrison Dula and Gideon Hask is, Hask is going to have a, uh, uh, a representation there as well um, in uh, that B-Wing. That looks pretty cool. Um, you know, so it's cool to see some Rebels and Battlefield 2 characters being brought in. We saw that, of mm -hmm. course, already with Inferno Squad for Star Wars Legion. Um, yep. But I think, actually, um, you know, I had played Legion. I had played X-Wing. I've kind of, you know, that sort of stopped and, and, and fallen to the side a little bit. Um, but they did mention that they were interested and they made a reference to doing maybe a co-op mode. And I remember back in the day, there was a, a, a fan-made um, series called uh, Heroes of the Atari Clust uh, Cluster. Mm -hmm. um, Atari, Ataru. Well, you know, it'd be cool to do some sort of co-op or like envision different styles of gameplay. Like, I'm not sure if that's what the, the hardcore X-Wing players are looking for. Mm -hmm. But um, that did catch my eye and being like, oh, you know, I might dig out some of my stuff to try like a new game mode like that. And that could be fun. Yeah, I think with the X-Wing experience is largely complete. Um, there's already so much to choose from, so much diversity in the right. range that how much more moves the needle for folks? Right. Like how many more variations do you need of what you have? Um, games have a, a lifespan and a maturity. So um, I think it's fair to say that maybe new experiences might ignite interest outside of that core group. But right. I don't think the giving... Um, sort of fans iterations of models and keep pushing those things out is really that meaningful and probably not very successful mm -hmm. it's probably diminishing returns for any organization that yeah. has a business model that way absolutely um for me the one thing that you know x-wing always has a place in my heart because my wife loved that game but she just is like that just hit it she just like the way the maneuvering that like really clicked mm -hmm. and she was like this is so much fun and i was like all right <laughs> like sweet um of course, you beat me too much, so then we stop playing. Uh, really? Oh my gosh, yeah, yeah. She's the, she's the competitive one of the two of us. I'm like, yeah. oh my gosh. Um, 
And then Armada. So we had the Providence class uh, carrier for the uh, Separatists, uh, the Venator class Starship Destroyer for the Republic, and the Pelta class Medical Frigate. So they're really hitting the Clone Wars stuff hard, and and that's mm-hmm. seen sort of a resurgence. So in my area, Armada had kind of trickled trickled out and died out a little bit. There'd been some long gaps, but now this Clone Wars stuff is getting a lot of people interested. So it's cool to to see that getting you know refueled. It is. Um, I can't help feeling though that the that you know part of the the license is fairly dated now, and there are yeah. new experiences with other sort of movies and stuff. I think um, Armada is a game that I've not really had much experience with, but I know that people who've played it. So you devote a whole Saturday afternoon to sitting down on yeah. a large table. And it looked like a load of fun. So um, I'll get there one day. But for me, that's just off my radar at the moment. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, and so then the, the last bit of news was that they uh, they kind of touched on it briefly, but then they recapped the next day. They did talk a little about their organized play announcements, and uh, we'll link to those in the comments below. But kind of one of the big things was that uh, – we don't know. There's a lot of uncertainty, and they've got a lot of plans, right? They had reference maybe doing something cool for Star Wars Legion, like uh, referencing Vader down and having it be like a scenario where like it's like Darth Vader versus a whole force, like some kind of fun in-store uh, narrative elements. Um, but if you were playing on the competitive scene and events got canceled that you had qualified for, they wanted to really assure everybody that you will have um, an invite to the next time they can do that so if right. if it's 2021 and we can do that sort of stuff great you've got an invite if it's not until 2022 don't worry you're still going to be involved in that you didn't miss out on that experience and so that i think that makes sense that's reasonable it is and people put a lot of effort time and money into making sure that they're competitive in those games so it's great they've been taken care of and i think that's probably the best solution for everyone so for x so for the dates for that sort of stuff we've got march 26 for the x-wing stuff April 16th for Armada and then Legion stuff that's May 20th so a little bit of a little bit of a wait there but I guess this year in general has been a slower year for getting stuff yeah well hopefully you can pick up some of the existing products a little easier before then because it's been quite difficult to get hold of certain releases that's true that's true but so you know a lot of cool news coming out of AMG and we're really looking forward to seeing what else they do so that that March stretch where they do their big stream of Palooza not their words our words (laughs) uh their stream of Palooza that'll be that'll be cool to see what they've got Yep, I, I, I wait with bated breath, and uh, I, I really hope that we're impressed, and uh, it sets the tone for what we're going to see from Legion and the other experiences over the next year or so. In the meantime, I'm I'm really looking forward to painting some other stuff up, maybe doing some conversions. I know later in this we've got a segment on your LED lightsabers and how to do that, so that yes. might be the next thing on my radar. Well, good luck, because uh, <laughs> it's pretty tricky, but I've got into quite a lot of detail. You'll see later on. So uh, I hope people enjoy it. And if you've got any comments, as usual, please come to the On The Table Facebook group, share your creations, your comments, or even ask questions. We're always happy to get back to you. But before we jump into all that Star Wars goodness, we're going to follow up with part two of our interview with Andy Hobday, focusing on the Baron's War. Now, if you haven't checked out part one of our interview, head on over to last week's Table Talk episode two and make sure you catch up on the history of his experience in the gaming industry, Mortal Gods, Coven, and all the other projects he's worked on. Today's is going to focus specifically on Baron's War. And so that being said, we're really excited to introduce Andy Hobday to the show. All right, so Andy, uh, we're really excited to talk to you about another one of your products. And I know last week we talked about Mortal Gods and kind of the background and how you got into game design. Baron's War, my, my Facebook feed has been filled with people, happy people <laughs> getting their most recent Kickstarter uh, fulfillments for Baron's War. Can you can you maybe just give us a, the elevator pitch for, for Baron's War? What is it? Yeah, it's a medieval skirmish game, which is set between the years of 1215 and 1217 so it's england at civil war uh a bunch of the barons uh usually called the northern barons uh, have got disenchanted with king john and uh they've decided that he needs to sign a treaty called the magna carta and this magna carta what the idea is is to stop him just doing whatever he wants to do so under duress uh king john signs this magna carta and a few days later he decides that he's not going to be holding to it because he's the king and at this point the barons have had enough they they think right that's it uh and led uh by one of them uh they create what's the called the army of god because they believe they're on a holy holy uh mission to to stop king john in his ways and they kick off a civil war within within england so 
the the rules are set in that kind of historical period and uh the whole idea of them is to create a a skirmish game which can be so you can play small skirmishes up to big skirmishes and by 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 skirmish i'm i'm saying a, a groups or units of guys are loosely formed and not rank and file they're not racked up and that's the difference but uh and and refight the encounters or encounters that you believe happened during that period fantastic why why the baron's war why why that particular time period was it because of the disjointed nature of relationships in the united kingdom and the fact that you could fight anybody on that scale Yes, uh, there's three three reasons I think for it. One is uh, you can create a re- from a from a gaming point of view, you can create a range of miniatures that both sides can use. So uh, producing that and and having a really good offer uh, is is I was going to say an easy thing to do. It's not an easy thing to do, but it, you can get quite a large range of miniatures quite quickly that people can choose from. Uh, personally, uh, my interest in that period came from a, ga- a game called Cry Havoc, which uh, you'll probably, I, I don't mean this in a, in a negative way, Chase, you're probably too young to remember Cry Havoc. I appreciate that. Uh, and and, and, and the Andy, please come on. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, what is this? Uh, it's I'm a game. Guy. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> like 30 years ago, uh, I, I picked this game up. I think I was about, well, more than that. 35 years ago when I was about 14 I picked this game up uh, and I, it was I just like the dynamic of knights uh, looking like knights you know in, in history and you know spearmen to spearmen the peasant levy that kind of thing so they were uh, that game really stuck with me and I played a lot of it so that kind of period uh, it, it got me re- we talked about it last week you know where we were talking about uh, history and, and further reading from there it, I it said it's uh, in in the blurb for the Barons War. It talks about uh, sorry in Cry Havoc. It talks about the Barons War. So then I went and devoured all the books I could find at my local library as a teenager on that period. And then I came across a guy uh, who no one really really knows about, and he uh, a guy called William Marshall, and he uh, is really this guy who. Uh, should be taught in schools i believe you know uh he saved us all from the french from a french invasion well not really because of french but you know the french invasion at the time he was a leading statesman he served five different kings you know this guy's really interesting and 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 what he has is his uh son had a his biography commissioned about him not long after he died so when you read books about william marshall they've got lots and lots and lots of really pertinent and interesting information in because it was written quite close to the time and there's there's other characters who are equally as exciting or as interesting but because of this character this guy this character william marshall you know brings the whole baron's war to life for me so yeah they they were the three things yeah you see um, william marshall feature very prominently in the lineup of your miniatures as well um, and in the rules um this is one yes. of the most sort of main areas i think you guys have done a fantastic job in promoting it but and certainly giving him a spotlight <laughs> in this feral system so um now i'm excited to learn more there um i guess the next thing then is um when you design a game like baron's war um yeah obviously you take from other experiences you've had in the past um it's probably quite challenging to build a game from the ground up something like no one's ever seen and obviously there are other types of systems which promise the similar kind of skirmish combat how did you go about the initial design of the game and what what did you pull from in terms of core mechanics that you thought would work well for this system Uh, that's a great question uh there's a bunch of mechanics that i like to play Having having now been playing for like 35, nearly 40 years, there's, there's a bunch of mechanics that I really like. I like skirmish. I, I like uh, rank and file games. I really do. Uh, but for me, the idea is I like lots of terrain. I like lots of uh, movement, et cetera, on the table. So it, that drives drives what uh, the rules that I, I want to play. So I start by picking out all of the, 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 in a game, there's a bunch of things that you must do. You know, you, you know, 
And on a tabletop game, there's movement, there's fight, you know, combat, there's shooting, you know, and me- melee, there's et cetera, et cetera. If you're going to do fantasy, there's magic, all of those things. So you could, you know, put the receptacles out before you start and think, right, how how is a turn? What kind of turn do I like base system? What How's a round going to look? How's combat going to look? How, what dice do I want to use, et cetera, et cetera. And you can just put those elements on the table. And that's what I like to do. I like to think, right, this is this is what I like. This is what I like. And I, I start with that. And then we take that, we go and play it. And obviously it's awful. <laughs> <laughs> because you, it's, you've, written a game, you've written a game up here and not on the table. Yeah. So, so uh, let's not talk about the first version of the Barrett's War. Uh, so you, you then take that and you refine those concepts with, with actually playing playtesting and you play test and play test and play test down into what you want it to be. But uh, the, if you, if you uh, played a lot of games or read a lot of games, if you've uh, developed some games or, or been around it enough, you, you, these concepts are there, you know what they are. And it's just uh, find, you know, finding the ones that work and then coming up with something you know, slightly different, you know, otherwise you may as well just, we'll play Warhammer or, or, or Saga or, you know, one of the other games. There has to, there has to be a reason, I think, to bring a new game to the table. Yeah. You know, uh, so yeah, that, that's it. And it, it, for, for the driver for this was, I wanted to create a, a game, a skirmish game, which was quite open in how you created your forces because at the time they were, they just brought the guys who they had for a fight. Mm-hmm. So the the the, uh, the the Baron or the Lord would say, He's, here's me and my retainers who I pay, and they're all well-fed and they've got great weapons. And here's everybody else to make up the numbers. <laughs> so you need to, it, it, it's not uniform, you know, it's not uniform. Right. I, you, I need one to 10 spearmen and five to six, you know, five to 10 crossbowmen or whatever. It's, well, what if I want this many or what, you know, want that many? Uh, and that that's really how we created the game it was we want the armies to look like that I want to use d10s I want it to be you you know not you go I go I want that kind of interaction so everybody you're both in the game all the way through I wanted to have actions and reactions so I do something you can do something back and uh, the big thing for me was morale because I thought you know you've got knights these big armored tanks, you know, charging at a bunch of guys armed with pitchforks, it's going to scare them. So, you know, having that morale factor as well. So, yeah, that does it. I, I feel like I'm waffling. Does that answer? Does that answer the question? I, find find the bits you like. Find the elements you like. Play it. To, play it. Play it. Play it. Then refine it. That's that's how we do it. I think you've been pretty comprehensive there. I, I was going to say, um, one of the reasons that we're interested in Baron's War is that we come from a background where we've played A Song of Ice and Fire, where there are very similar types of mechanics, obviously being a low fantasy game maps well to the historic experience. Um, yeah. One of the challenges with designing these types of games is um, at that time, a person is a person. And so you don't have mythical elements and magical yeah. powers to distinguish them. And I noticed in the rules that you've based that on the experience that each individual would have. You can go anywhere from um, somebody who's basically just been pulled off a field with a pitchfork all the way to someone who's a highly trained veteran knight um, within the yeah. rule systems. And you can select from those to create your, is it a war band that you're creating for this game? Uh, it's a retinue. retinue. But it's a, it, it, could, it could be a war band, but I think retinue is more, more fitting. Mm. But no, you're absolutely right. Uh, the, when we, again, uh, to balance the forces, we created a, a human as a human as a human. Mm-hmm. You know, so you start with that basic human uh, statistic and then we went up and down based on experience. So by, if you were playing a fantasy, you know, high fantasy game where you had dwarves and elves and orcs, that basic stat will change on its own. Right. Mm-hmm. But the reality is, you know, the human body can only do so many things. You know, it's a it's a it's a flesh bag, isn't it? Really, with some bones. <laughs> Brings um, back the keto right here. I can tell. Exactly. I can see. It. I hear the echoes. I know what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and and you know, if the more battles you see, you know, the more chance you might stay, or you've you've you know you've learned to be a bit more wily, or if you're green and you're off the land, you know, your morale's not going to be as high. But all of that makes them humans. What we did in the game to 
distinguish between a knight and a and a spearman was it was their training and their abilities so you know a knight would be uh, taught the sword from when they could hold one taught to ride you know that kind of thing so we would they they suddenly got those abilities and that improved weaponry uh and that's kind of what then starts to make them different but if you start to strip it all down they're, they're the same well, so I need some help here then because uh, Simon's got like helmets like off screen that he's pulling up. He's like a little <laughs> marshal here. So I, if I'm going to play against Simon here. Any tips on like what maybe a, a specific baron or king or something, you know, like something I should, uh, you know, start looking towards so that I can be prepared to do battle with him here? Any suggestions? Yeah. yeah that, well, you, you've got a choice. In, within the game, we, we've included uh, a bunch of set characters. As Simon says, you know, William Marshall's in there. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, a lot of the other him first and be like, sorry, Simon. Get him first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not, not the King John type guy they chase, oh, really. Yeah. Wow. All right. I see how this is. Oh my gosh. So it, you could you could choose choose one of those characters and build your build your retinue around those. Or there is also an arm uh, like a character builder, because we couldn't do all of the named oh. barons. At, well, we could, but we'd we'd never have released the book. But uh We've done a like a character builder. So if you wanted to be a particular, you know, like William Warren, for instance, we haven't done him, but he William De Warren, he's a he's quite an exultant baron at the time. You could go and create him yourself by just using a point builder and give him some abilities to tie him in and away you go. Or awesome. you could just you could just create yourself. If oh, you, there we go. You know, King Chase uh, or Baron Chase. I said. Baron Chase, Chase yeah. Strikes <laughs> fear into the uh, the hearts of the wicked or but he's very reasonable too. So yeah. somewhat, somewhat, <laughs> yeah, somewhat reasonable. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk it out here. I got to. You know, <laughs> so, so we kind of tried to keep it as open as possible. Absolutely, and you got a bunch of Kickstarters as uh, that you've gone through, and maybe some things in the works. Uh, Simon and I were joking about your first Kickstarter. <laughs> uh, it has a, a trebuchet uh, that is it was one of the stretch goals. I have yeah. a yes. I have a uh, I've had a bad experience with those in the past. Like I said, say allegedly, allegedly, my dad is a uh, a woodworker. He's a shop teacher, and when I was uh, maybe like sixth grade, I, I thought that was the coolest thing. Siege weapons are so cool. So I was like, we gotta make one. Let's like make one. <laughs> so at the school, he was like, let's just do it. We'll use some of the materials, and he made a twelve foot trebuchet, which is so cool. And like he looked up the plans <laughs> online. Yeah. And so it was like the big day and we're like, let's just, we'll check it out. Like just me and him, we, we wheel it out by the side of the school. We got a watermelon, we put it in the sling and there's a soccer field. It's like, we'll shoot it across the soccer field. And uh, it went and, and it, instead of going, I thought the trajectory was gonna be like a little more flat, but it just like arced up uh, and it uh, went yeah, yeah. across the soccer field over the trees into a neighborhood <laughs> and we just wheeled it back inside and we never did anything with it again. Uh, but, uh, so when I saw that Kickstarter, I was like, oh man, you know, this is the thing I've got, I've got to awesome. pick up as a, uh, as a, just a momentum here. <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, the, the first, the first Kickstarter was, uh, it was the first Kickstarter I'd ever done. And uh, I've never, I'd never even thought about doing them before, but uh, I wanted to do the Baron's War miniatures because it, uh, you can see I'm quite quite passionate about it. And we couldn't fit them into the release schedule for Futsal. So I'd, I'd started to have some made when we we took over Futsal, which was about four or five years ago. And uh, it was always, Mark was always, oh, oh yeah, we'll do it next year, we'll do it next year. And in the end, I just, right, right, I'm going to do it myself, <laughs> and then stormed out. And uh, luckily, I, I know Paul Hicks from my days at Games Workshop. We used to work in uh, Games Workshop stores together uh, in our 20s. So uh, I, I just said, do you want to do it? And he said, yeah, 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 he'll, he'll do it. So he's, he's sculpting all the, the miniatures and I'm doing all the rules and everything. And, and yeah, it's our, it's our own little pet project. That's so, wonderful. Yeah. The, the rules themselves, though, that came about as a result of the second Kickstarter. Is that correct? It did, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we, I'd never intended to do any rules, if I'm being honest, initially, uh, and then because there's there's plenty of rules out there. So uh, we got to the second one, and people again, people were just asking, and I said, okay, I'll I'll do a small alpha rule set so you can get your miniatures out and push them around, that kind of thing, and because uh, of 
uh, probably a good thing that's come out of the pandemic. I ended up locked down for for a few months, and I thought, oh, oh off we go. And instead of it being 50, 60 pages, it's 140 pages. <laughs> I, 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 I still took stuff out. So, you know, we got a, we got a full rule book. But, Wonderful. You know, you know um, I think it's definitely created a spark around certainly the entry point into gaming as well. There's nothing like getting cool mm. miniatures, but if you've got sort of a call to action, something you can use to think, okay, well, I'm going to play this game with my friends, that's going to be great. And I, I feel kind of that coming out of lockdown, people are now kind of shopping for experiences. So when that magic mm. day happens and we can go back to the game store and see our friends again, we're ready. We've got the armies <laughs> and we're going to start playing these new experiences as well. If people wanted to start the Baron's War or learn more about the game, how can they do that? Yeah. How can they get hold of the rules? Uh, the rules are currently uh, on pre-order uh, at futsalminiatures.co.uk. Uh, they'll be released next month. We just wanted to make sure that everybody who'd backed the second Kickstarter got their goodies before uh, anything was released. Uh, all the miniatures from the first Kickstarter are available there as well on Futsal. The second, all of the second range will join in March, I believe. I think they're going to go live in March. So Futsal Miniatures have, has it all. Wonderful. And um, the Baron's War is, is a kind of a, a period in time. And I know that you mentioned in your own podcast that you're looking to maybe expand out that timeline a little bit. Futsal have a tremendous wealth of miniatures. Can you talk a little mm. bit more about sort of moving both in sort of earlier Dark Ages and also later into the medieval period? Yeah, uh, I'd like to go backwards. Uh, and I, I'd intended to put a free army lists in for Normans, Vikings and Saxons into the, the alpha. Uh, and by the time it had grown into what it had grown into, they didn't fit. It was it just looked like I was going to be shoehorning them in. So I've taken those out, and I've I'm just finishing a, a supplement, a Dark Age. Well, I, I call it Dark Ages. The historians don't like it. Early medieval range of uh, <laughs> stuff. Uh, so there'll be a Dark Age supplement, which I'm going to give away as a free download. You know, so you can you can just play that. You'll need the rules, but all the army lists and stuff will be there. And the plan is to just keep adding army lists to that. So we'll go backwards and backwards uh, to about 400 uh, AD, which is uh, when the fall of Rome really in, in the West in, in England, where they pull out. So we'll have some Romano British and, and, and that kind of thing and early Saxons. And then the idea is it will cover all of the Saxons and, and the Irish and the, picks etc all the way up to uh where we are now so that will be that way and then we'll start the other way it, the beauty of the rules is you know a spearman's a spearman a bowman's a bowman you know uh a you know a uh, crossbowman as you get later is a crossbowman so with the way that we've written the rules you could really pretty much lift it now with the character builder and start playing it wherever you want to play it as long as as long as you're not progressing past chain mail, so we're talking, you know, probably about Robert the Bruce, you know, uh, you know, the rules will work, I think. Good. Um, what does the future hold for the Baron's War then? You mentioned sort of the Kickstarter projects. Have you anything forthcoming potentially where we can see a slight change? I think you're probably, you've, you've already got the miniatures for the Dark Age, but moving sort of forward in the medieval period, what's happening next? Yeah, the the next one is I'm I'm kind of bookending uh, the Baron's War. I, uh, Paul and I get a our next Kickstarter is we want to do a campaign like the old campaign books. So it'll have a bunch of link scenarios in there. We're going to shoehorn Robin Robin Hood in, and it'll be right, uh, based in Nottinghamshire. So uh, that's going to kick off in March. But we're going to do buildings and we're going to do a whole range of miniatures. We're going to do the town that it's released, the town that it's based in. Uh, the sheriff of Nottingham, we're going to use the actual sheriff at the time. It was a chap called Philip Mark. He was actually mentioned in the uh, in, in the Magna Carta. He was a, he was a bad sort. Uh, but we're also going to bring some bits in as well. Uh, we're going to get some Templars in there and some villagers. And there's, it's uh, based around... Uh, them wanting taxes from the from this village but little do they know there's a the blacksmith in the village is actually uh he's an old crusader from the time of uh richard the lionheart so they're going to come and start pushing him for taxes and he's going to push back is the the whole premise of the uh campaign so 
Yeah, looking forward to that. Visualize the trailer now. He's going to pick up that big hammer and he's going to <laughs> <Yes. yeah. laughs> lift, lift down his uh, crusader shield off. He yeah, goes, exactly. Yeah. Blow the dust off and uh, he's ready for action. <laughs> So where's uh, if people wanted to like kind of engage with the Barons War community, um, where are some locations they could head to to talk to other people who are interested in the game? Yeah, we're on Facebook because most people are. There's a Barons War group on Facebook. So that's been up now about four or five weeks. And uh, we're adding about 100, 150 people a week. So that's growing quite quickly. Uh, I think we're on about 1,600 at the moment. So... There's a good vibe on there. Uh, We've also uh, got a website, uh, which we've created called warhost.online. And that's going to grow as we go. And my plan is to start using that to put more and more projects on, do some, you know, release rules for people to try. There'll be downloads on there. There's a forum. And uh, everything I do eventually will go through there. So that's that's my plan. So at the moment, it's obviously very much about the Barons War because that was the latest. But uh, I have other other irons in the fire, as they say. So, uh, <laughs> so I've got Can we just plans. take a moment to talk about this wonderful artwork. Who is the artist? Yes. For the, yeah, the Barons War because I, I I've seen sort of um, a lot of this style. type of art. Yeah, this style on historical war books and stuff like that. So um, who was the artist? It's a chap called Peter Dennis. And uh, Peter Dennis is, uh, if you've read an Osprey book or two, mm-hmm. uh, he he uh, has illustrated lots and lots of them. Uh, I'm lucky. I'm lucky enough. I've been, over the last couple of years, I've become really good friends with Peter, and uh, I I actually from from my uh, web web days, I built his website for him. So he has a website which uh, he. He creates paper soldiers. I don't know if you've seen it. It's uh, Peter's Paper Boys. It's worth checking out. So right. he takes his artwork and he he draws all of the all of the different uh, forces, and you cut them out. You can you know you buy them, download them. They're, you know they're cheap for a, a sheet, and you can print them as many times as you want. And you can play massive games with paper soldiers. It's beautiful. Uh, and uh, we have a barter system. I I support him and his website and he supports me with my games so uh i'm very, very historical lucky. of you guys you gotta <laughs> really <get into> that. <laughs> <laughs> very lucky he's a, he's a he's a real gentleman as well and he's he's uh, he drew the cover of uh mortal gods as well mm-hmm. oh yeah so uh he's a he's a yeah it's beautiful he's a real he's a real gentleman and he's in and his art is just beautiful very very lucky very lucky with that Perfect. And well, that's that's William Marshall, by the way, Chase. Oh, okay. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> right. He's looking pretty good there. He is. <laughs> well, we certainly look forward to covering this game in more detail as we move forward with the show. Um, we're looking, we're looking for an experience like this, something which is a little different. We want, and I get the feeling that a lot of um, gamers, as their gaming career um, moves forward and develops. People then look for more of the historical um, aspects of that. Are you finding that with the kind of people that gravitate towards the games? What, what's your sort of demographic in terms of people who play? Yeah, I, th- I think, uh, again, we touched on this before. I think we are getting uh, X Games Workshop people usually or people who are looking for something different. Uh, but it is, I think, because we, we're creating a, a simpler gateway. Uh, people have heard of Test of Honor. They've heard of Mortal Gods. And it's bringing them over. It's nice. A lot of the names that I'm seeing are the same community. So we're bringing the same people in. So it is, it, I, I would say a lot of it is what I would call the historical crowd. However, by making this this kind of gateway historical game where, it, where we're using uh, really cool visuals and his, his, making it historically feel historical, but making it play more of a skirmish game we're getting younger people yeah which is good i think that's the way forward right just keep growing the community and and the coolest thing i love about games like this is that like you introduce to somebody uh who maybe didn't realize how interested they were right and then they try Mm. and this is going back maybe throwing back to mortal gods but like you know people who might not have considered it uh i've got a buddy who doesn't play historicals doesn't like the humans elements but when there was Mm. mythic then it was like, oh, cool. <laughs> then he got kind of into the regular thing. It's like, oh, now it's like, you know, great, come with us to come, come play some more. And 
And uh, just, yeah. you know, it's just great to be able to bring people in with these games. I, I agree. And I, and I also think uh, it, it's really interesting. I, I think back to my time at Games Workshop. All Games Workshop did was they've taken historical references and flipped them. Right. And, you know, 40K is absolutely full of it. Yeah. You know, it, for, Horus Heresy is Cain and Abel, you know, and right. you, you go all of the the Primarchs, all their names are from history. You know, you can go and find them all, you know, and, and everybody, Ultramarines and Romans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, uh, I just kind of want to flip it the other way where yeah. you find some really, really cool characters like like William Marshall, who was 70 at this time. He still <laughs> rode he still rode out at the head of uh, awesome. the, the Royalist Army at the Battle of Lincoln and, you know, into the fray. And he was he was there. And, and you know, they, they got... Other characters like Peter de Roche, who was the Archbishop of uh, Win- he was the Bishop of Winchester, leading the crossbowmen, you know, from the front, and these are real, real characters, and their stories and their background is just as exciting, I think, as forty k characters and and you know uh, characters from Song of Ice and Fire, which are great characters. Don't get me right. wrong, I'm not I'm not dissing any of it, right. but there's real people out there who are just as exciting, you know. Go go and read about this conflict. You know, Fox the Brut. This this guy, he was called uh, Fox the Brut. He was called the Brut because he 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 was a he was an illegit- illegitimate uh, son of a of a nobleman from France, and he he chopped someone, he killed someone with a scythe. You know, that's how he got his name, the Brut. And he came and he became King John's hatchet man, and he would ride up to a castle, and no one would. He was he was virtually like get him to close the door so he could have a fight with them because no one would fight him. They're all they're all so scared of him. And and these you know playing games with these guys is just yeah. as exciting, I think. Oh, and I love to you know your enthusiasm for the subject is definitely evident, and <laughs> it translates over in the games that you're making. And I think that's one of the the things that we saw right off the bat. You can just see that spark in them. Um, <laughs> Thank you. And I, and I just want to say thank you so much for coming on here to, to talk about the stuff you've been working on. Um, you know, we've been following your stuff closely and it's, we're really excited to see where things continue to develop. And, uh, you know, people are watching this and they haven't checked out all the stuff, uh, you know, Warhost, for example, you know, go on over there, check it out. There's a ton of Facebook communities that are very active. Jump on in there. And, uh, you know, we hope we can talk to you again in the future as you've got some more uh, projects coming out. I'd love to come back if you have me. <laughs> I think so. Absolutely. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Heck, just for the, you, you referenced, there's like, you know, 18 months worth of uh, Coven stuff last episode. You know, I want to see some more artwork or something. So you got a lot of cool projects coming up. So thank you thank so you. much. And, uh, you know, we'll, we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. It's always great to talk with Andy Hobby. He's doing such great work. And if you're into historicals, make sure you head on over to Andy Hobby's official Facebook page to stay in the loop about all the cool stuff he's got coming up. Next up, we've got our segment where Simon's going to take us through how to make your own Star Wars Legion LED lightsabers. Hello there. So today we are going to cover how to create some fantastic looking LED lightsabers for your Star Wars Legion miniatures. Now, I used to do this on a commission basis and probably have completed about 100 different miniatures. And I can tell you right now, there's been a quite a lot of failure while doing that. Um, I'm rather the perfectionist and I think people really do want high quality results. So what I'm willing to do is to share all of my techniques so you can follow along at home and hopefully replicate these types of results. Now, there are a variety of different ways you can do this. Um, I favor drilling out the middle of the models and using LEDs and routing those LEDs through the plastic models themselves. Now this can be fraught with certain issues such as potentially the drill coming out the side of where you're drilling in a very delicate lightsaber and so there are some other techniques as well. So this isn't definitive, this is just the way that I've done it. Um, a lot of people struggle with the electrics and how the battery sits in the bottom of the base and so I have a technique which I'll share with you as well which you can use at home to hopefully get you much more reliable results. Now as you can see below I have a variety of different miniatures set up here. Now um, one of the things which you'll notice is that some of these LEDs are obviously different colours and so we're going to go through the techniques and how to match an LED to the acrylic rods which are used to transmit the light. In addition to that we'll We'll cover resistor usage as well because I know some people will be interested in that and this helps a little bit to get more longevity out of certain LEDs especially 
the red ones. So what we're going to do now is let's get some lights on. I'm going to take you step by step through some of the tools which are required. And then we're going to look at some of the techniques we can use to actually create these types of results. Next up is to show you some of the tools and materials that I use for these conversions. I've compiled a list on Amazon, and if you'd like to acquire these items, you can click on the referral link and put them straight in your basket. You may not need all of them, so feel free to shop the ones that you need. Now, the first thing we have at the top of the screen here is the fluorescent acrylic rods. There we go. You can see them quite clearly here. Um, these are fairly expensive um, and they come in three different colors. Let me get them on camera. There we go. So I've got red, uh, a yellow, which actually is pretty good for green lightsabers like Luke Skywalker and the blue as well, predominantly using these two. I believe you can get clear and use color LEDs, but I've never really used that. I'm very happy with the results that I get. So with the acrylic rods, you'll notice that obviously they are a 16th of an inch all the way along. And one of the challenges that I've seen with these types of conversions is that people will just snip them off and use that as the lightsaber. The problem is, is that the end actually is quite square. And so it looks like a acrylic day glow baseball bat on some models. And we're looking to try and avoid that. We're looking for something a little more elegant. Um, you can see here with this Darth Maul, which is in progress, I've actually rounded the edges a little bit. So um, I'm using sandpaper on the acrylic rod and actually taking a little bit of weight off the end. Now be careful, you don't want to take too much off because you want the light to actually go through this, but just giving it a little shape gives far more impressive results. Um, what I typically do is I do a number of lightsabers at the same time and I cut them so they're a little longer than you need. Don't cut them too short because you'll regret it and it will look silly on your model. Okay, so those are the acrylic rods. Next up, we have the LEDs. And the LEDs really are the star of the show. They come in a box like this. And these are very specifically the 0, sorry, 0, 4, 0, 2 uh, LEDs. And I believe these are 3 volt. Um, it depends on the color, actually. Let's have a look here. Yeah, these are 3 volt or 2 volt. Now, you'll notice that the red ones are slightly less voltage. And that's indicative of an issue which we'll see what we cover in a minute. We're actually connecting these up to a cell. So you can see here that these are, they come and get like 20 in a box or something like that, I think. And very, very, very small. You can see there that the LED is this little white thing at the end with two wires, a positive and a negative. Now I'm gonna quickly, very quickly as I can, get a battery and connect this up so you can see how light it is. These are super, super bright. So. Um, now the black is negative and the red is positive. You'll need to remember that. Oh, this is a green one here. There we go. So you can see how bright that is. You have to be careful because you can pull these off. These are very loosely soldered onto the end here and you may need to reposition like I've done here. So the LEDs are actually at 45 degree angle. So it actually shines out the end of the lightsaber. Right. Um, we mentioned the red, um, LEDs being slightly less voltage and you can do a whole bunch of calculations for um, how you can work out if you need a resistor or not. The rule of thumb, and I learned this from people online, is that red LEDs probably do need a resistor otherwise they could burn out. These are some resistors here. You can see here, <laughs> these are super, super tiny. So on the screen here, this is what you're seeing. And you buy these, I think there are, I don't know, maybe a hundred or so in a strip. We will solder these. It is fiddly, but it can be done and it can fit underneath the base. It will just give your LED a lot more lifespan and you'll probably not regret doing stuff like this. Okay, copper tape. Copper tape is our conductor and we use this underneath the base to um, connect the cell or the battery to the soldered connection wires. So um, this serves as the electrical conductor. The reason that people use this type of tape is that it's very, very easy to apply. You don't have to cut sheet metal and make your own terminals, and you don't have to mess around with things like magnets. So um, I really recommend this. And if you're trying to do this type of work, seriously consider acquiring this. Okay, next up we have tweezers. <laughs> when you do stuff like this, you need these. If you don't have something really, really tiny to help thread LEDs through or hold wires while you're soldering, you're gonna really hate yourself. Um, I tried this for a number of months before I actually got these. And once I acquired the tweezers, it was really transformational. So I would really recommend you pick up these tweezers. You can see here, these are the ones I recommend and they're fairly reasonably priced. Right, so when making these models, um, what we need to do is actually channel out the middle of the limbs. And to do this, we use drills. Now, people use pin vices, 
and they may also elect to use something like this which is a conductive silver paint now i've not actually had good results with the conductive silver paint at all um, it's been somewhat problematic uh, it does degrade and it doesn't actually lead to very bright led results Inevitably, some people have to use it on models like General Grievous. Um, because of the nature of the limbs, it's very difficult to thread wires through the limbs, almost impossible. And some people just don't like the wires outside of the model. Um, it does give us a sort of a, a noticeable effect. Um, but like I said, with General Grievous, it's somewhat unavoidable. But um, I would avoid this on regular models because you can actually just drill through the middle of the limbs. Now, these, um, uh, let's have a look here. There we go. These drill bits um, can be used by hand and you can see they're super simple. One thing you're going to notice is a you get five of these for 18 bucks. You might think, well, I only need a few. You don't you need a lot because you're going to break them. Any amount of lateral or sideways pressure will actually break these. So you have to be super, super careful. You always have to move them in the direction of the, um, the drill itself. So it could perpendicular to the, um, the drill bit. Um, make sure that you practice with these before you actually apply them to the model. The soft plastic on Legion models is actually quite easy to drill, but these have been the best thing I've bought to help with this process. Um, what we're doing is we're basically hollowing out legs, body, arms, arms, etc., to actually get the LEDs there. There's a little bit of magic um, as to how we actually get the drill around corners, but you probably guess how we do that. It's pretty straightforward. Okay. Next up, we have sandpaper. This is the sandpaper that I use for um, the uh, filing down the, uh, the lightsabers themselves. It's 400 grit. I used to use a lot finer, but to be honest, I really like the slightly matte finish it gives on the lightsabers and it doesn't allow the light to, um, to sort of um, bounce off the outside, which gives a far better result. I also use this particular um, sandpaper when filing down the resin bases to get a nice finish. We will potentially look at some 3D printed bases that I have that STL will be available for on the table Patreon. So um, feel free to, to join and you'll be able to get the STL and print out your own bases. And I think you're gonna like what you see. So this is what I use. If you're using this on resin, please A, wear some kind of mask and B, make sure it's wet, it's wet and dry. So dampening it down can actually stop a lot of the particulates uh, getting into the air. Okay, um, next up we get to the slightly more expensive stuff. Um, there we go, we have um, a soldering station. Now. I went for this because I was doing this quite a lot. I was doing quite a few different commissions and um, it's so much simpler with this type of solder, soldering iron. The reasons for this are twofold. First of all, you can control the temperature. By controlling the temperature, you get much more accurate results. Uh, secondly, it has very, very fine tip. Um, I think it's called an iron. I'm not sure what the end of it's called, probably the folding iron, but um, it, by making it fine, you can get directly to what you, the point that you need. Um, you can get soldering irons which just have the iron itself and a plug out of the other end. You can't really control the temperature, and I've used those before, but um, since I upgraded to this type of soldering station, it's great. You can get results, however, with a more conventional, slightly more reasonably priced soldering iron, and I did that for a year or so before I invested in this. In addition to the um, soldering iron, you will potentially need some flux. Flux helps the solder flow, and when it's really, really tiny, um, you don't want a lot of temperature um, on your model. So using something like this will help with the flow. And then we have the solder itself, and basically any kind of uh, sort of tin, lead, rosin core solder would work. I choose this one, and I get good results. Um, chop around because it is priced differently. And then finally, we have magnets. Magnets are, are great and uh, they are used in this project, but only a little bit. Some people use magnets for electri electrical connections um, under the base. The problem with that is that you inevitably have to solder to neodymium magnets. And there's a problem with that because if you apply heat to a neodymium magnet, it will reduce the magnetism. So I use these basically just to hold the cell in place, um, but the bases that I use actually have friction fit for the cells, so you don't normally have a problem. It's just a nice to have to make the battery sit firmly in there and to stop it falling out if it would. Um, like I said, this is probably optional, but um, I would, if you're using a conventional FFG base, then inevitably you might look for something like magnets for the electrical connectivity. Great, so we've gone through all the tools. Um, next up is for me to start showing you how to do this type of stuff. Um, we're gonna be working on a Count Dooku here. It's a more straightforward miniature. Let me see if I could just zoom in a touch. Let's see if we can get him, there we go, there. 
So we're going to be um, working on account Dooku. Uh, like I said, it's quite straightforward. And one thing you'll notice is that we have our custom base. This is our 3D printed base. I'll be showing you how we use this, how the cell fits in there, and how we wire it all up as well. Uh, but we're going to start first of all by actually going in and hollowing out the model, uh, basically making some strategic cuts so it's easily, easier for us to drill through. Okay, so I've switched to the overhead view and you can see here we've got some bits that we're going to be using to help us route out the middle of Count Dooku so we can basically push the LED through the middle. Um, in addition to the tools mentioned, first of all, cutting mat is really important. Make sure you get one of these. Um, you're going to save yourself a lot of heartache and probably a little bit of trouble at home. So um, recommend that. Um, I do have a regular pin vise. Um, sometimes I do use it to help push through a hole and clean out a hole that I've drilled. Got my tweezers and also got a craft knife. We're going to need this. Um, I would recommend getting quite sharp and uh, blades like this um, these work pretty well um, they are very reliable and quite cheap you get 120 so um, I don't tend to overuse them for cutting plastic I don't really want to push through a model I want to try and cut through it okay so let's take a look at Dooku first of all move this to one side unboxing video not really I just want to get the get the goodies out of here let's have a look um, do we have a model in here have a look. there we go Found him. There we go. So this is what we get out of the box, and we just get some different components in addition to the FFG base. We'll talk about that a little, a little bit in the next section. Okay. So this is what we get in the box, and we don't need all of this. First of all, we don't need this right now, and we don't need the arm for sure, and we don't need the head. Just these two pieces are going to be working with. Now the first step is for us to work out how we can channel through these different pieces, and it's inevitable that we can't drill all the way from here to here very easily. And so what we're going to do is actually can make some strategic cuts using our craft knife. Now, uh, first up, we're going to look to uh, level off the lightsaber here at the end of the hilt. Be a bit careful because you'll notice that Dooku actually has this little piece uh, here. Let me just show you this. There we go. A little piece at the end of the lightsaber here. So what you want to try and do is actually maybe cut that off and apply it to the acrylic rod later. But all you would need to do is to go here. Now, little tip for you is using some poster putty, just put it on your cutting mat like this. What this does, it stops things pinging everywhere. And if you lose pieces on the floor, you, you'll you just be, uh, put it this way, it'll make you very, very upset. You wanna be quite calm when doing this because it's fairly frustrating as it is. Okay, so I'm just gonna go flush with the lightsaber and just cut through very simply like this. There we go. And you see here, we've got a cut here and uh, we've got the lightsaber. We won't be needing this, but do keep it because you may want to use it to measure the length of the acrylic rod when you're applying it later. I typically make the acrylic rods a little bit longer because I think they look a bit, look a bit more dramatic. There we go. So next step is for us to start drilling. And a little tip for you is, um, as you see, we can't drill from here to here very easily. It's going to be close to impossible. So we're going to make another cut and we're actually going to cut here uh, is where his sleeve and hand are because it won't show um, and when you glue these back you're gonna it's gonna be pretty much invisible now to do this uh, what we're gonna do first of all is actually drill out the lightsaber and I'm gonna be really careful it's hard doing this on camera um, but I'm gonna make a little pilot hole here let me see if that's right I can barely see this my you'll find when you get to chasers of my age uh, your eyesight starts to fail so this can be quite tricky you need a lot of light here um, there we go. So this will be the pilot hole. And then simply what I do is I get a drill. I'm going to use one of the smaller ones, but not the smallest because it will just break off. There we go. And all I would need to do is put it into the pilot hole and then start drilling. Turn it by hand very carefully just to get it started. You do need to apply pressure, but the secret really is to take this very, very gently. For me to do this on video is going to take quite a while, so I'm not going to show you every single piece of this. What we're going to do is we're going to drill through to about here where the hand is. And to do this, what we do is you just pull out the drill and we just measure roughly where we are and then put it back in. And we, what you'll notice is that sometimes if you go too far, the plastic will start going white to the other end because it's trying to push out of the plastic. If it does, just stop and um, sort of try it from a slightly different angle. So I'm gonna drill into here. And then what I would do is I would cut off at the hand and I'm actually gonna cut through the lightsaber a little bit here. Just do this. Now, the reason that I've drilled first of all, rather than drilling into the hand first is that drilling really small pieces is quite fiddly. So if you can drill them while they're attached to the rest of the model, it makes it a lot easier to hold. Poster putty's a bit sticky, there we go. So I would drill through this direction here, and then what I would do is drill to the other side and make it meet up with the hole, then thread the LED through. 
With this arm here, um, it's slightly different. You'll notice that we can't get all the way through very easily. And so what I would do again is make a pilot hole uh, here. Let me just clean that knife off. There we go. Um, just about here. There we go, you see a little hole there. Haven't done a great job on there because it is on camera. Um, and then I would basically start drilling from this direction. Now, a little tip for you is when doing this, you think, well, it's gonna be hard to get them to meet up and it can be very frustrating. What you would do is you'd drill in with this drill to here and leave the drill in and get another one and drill from the other direction. And you'll notice when the drills meet, you'll get a bit of friction, you can feel it. And that's when you know you've hit the other drill bit. So little tips like that make it quite easy for you. So we've created, one piece here, two pieces here. Next up, we are going to look at the body. And again, we can do some surgery here. Um, I would recommend using a straight leg. <clears throat> the reason for that is that the foot actually fits quite flat on the surface there. So I would go to probably the boot there and I would cut this off here. It can be a bit nerve wracking um, cutting your models, but it, it, like I said, they will glue together. You'll not, you'll not notice where the joins are. And unless you put, also take a photo of the model before you cut it up because you want to get the orientation of the boots right. It's no good him looking like that because it looks a bit silly. So we want to make sure that that would actually go back there. Again, pilot hole. You can use a bigger drill where you've got thicker plastic. The, in, the inner plastic on these FFG models, the soft plastic ones, are actually quite easy to drill. And then we'll drill through this direction and then we've got a little recess here drill the other direction as well. So basically that's what the drilling is. Now if folks really want to see me drilling, it's gonna take maybe an hour or so to do a model. Um, I'll be happy to do it as a follow-up video. Let's just see what kind of response we get here, but um, I'll leave it to your own good common sense to actually how to route these out. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is to create something which looks like this. And you can see that I've actually threaded the LED through from here to here. We'll be talking a little bit in the next section about how to apply LEDs, how to orientate them and get them into the end of the lightsaber, as well as wiring up the bottom of the base. So a little bit of shaky cam here, I had to zoom in a little bit, so apologies for that. Um, what we're gonna be talking next is bases. You can see that I have here the FFG base. Now this works pretty well for most things. Um, you'll notice that it has a recess and we can actually put a cell in here quite easily and it will sit flush. Let me just show you which cells I'm using. I would recommend these, the CR2016. I'll add those to the Amazon affiliate link so you can buy those as well. You can get 10 for like nine bucks, I think. Now, um, putting them in a regular base is great, but I've seen some issues. Um, first of all, people struggle with the connect connectivity, uh, connecting to the cell. You'll notice there's a positive and negative terminal and people use magnets and things like that and get inconsistent results. So you can do this. Um, what you would do is you'll drill through uh, where the foot goes, the wires come through, and then you apply them to the terminal. Um, that's how I got started. And if you wanna give that a shot, please do. But I would recommend that you try something like this. So what I've done is I've created a STL for a 3D printed base that you can make yourself. And you'll notice that already that we've got some sort of enhancements here, which is gonna make this a lot easier for you. Um, I, I print these flat on the build plate. Like, so basically they're printed like that. And you'll get a slight elephant foot. So again, use our sandpaper and just take this off here just to make it nice and uh, sort of uh, flush. And you can just clean up the edges as well. And it'll make it just look like the re regular FFG bases. Now within the base itself, we have a really small hole here. And this is where we put our magnet in like this. And this will allow us to put the cell in and for the battery to sit. But the battery is very much a, let me just take that out, otherwise we're gonna have problems. There we go. Um, the battery sits flush in here anyway. It's a friction fit. This makes it so the battery is not gonna fall out. And it's very easy to repair this type of thing. We can just, again, just put it in there like this. Um, you'll notice there's a recess at the top. That's where we do our wiring, potentially put the resistor. To wire up this particular base, the next step is for us to do something like this. And you notice I've put a strip of the copper tape um, over the middle, the magnets underneath, so that will actually hold the battery in quite nicely. This one, there we go, is friction fit. And you can see here that we, at the top, we have the tape sticking out. Now, what we would also do is we would apply some tape along the side here. So let me just show you exactly what I mean. We would put a little bit of tape along here and it will fold around the side. And that's our second terminal. That's going to be our uh, positive terminal. And all we would need to do is solder here and here, and that will connect the battery. Let me actually show you one which I've done. This is a Dooku which I worked on previously. And you can see it's a little bit messy. I'm just gonna take you through this, make sure you can see what's going on. So this is the strip, the first strip I put in. 
this is the second it goes around here and just around the corner this is sticky tape so you just basically push it down then you notice that I put a blob of solder here and I've soldered the, um, the black wire to that and on here I put a blob of solder here and then I got the resistor and I just basically pushed it into the solder when it was hot and then um, took the red wire and uh, soldered it to the other end of the resistor. Now this is not going to be a soldering tutorial. I will do it in an extended video if people really want to see it, um, but I would advise people to maybe practice a lot before doing something like this. However, the objective of this design is to make this as simple as possible. There's only really three soldering uh, joints that you need to make. Um, to do this, if there's any issues with failure, then it's going to be here and you can actually fix it up quite easily just with some more solder and some more tape. You will need to cut the wires to length. Um, when you cut the wires, don't cut them too short because you're going to have a real problem for yourself. Joining wires is, in these um, types of wires is almost close to impossible. And also bear in mind that um, when we actually put the wires on here, I just tin them, which is apply a little bit of solder to the ends of the wires just so they will take a little bit. Um, using flux will allow the solder to uh, flow in there. And so that's basically it. You can see here that just applying a battery, again, it should friction fit. There we go. And we got the lightsaber on. Now it's really, really dim on this light because I've got like three lights on my workspace, but it's actually quite impressive. Um, you'll notice that um, the matte finish actually gives it some kind of a, a sort of, uh, there we go, glow down the whole length of the lightsaber. Right, um, the final thing I wanted to touch on was actually putting the LEDs into the model itself. And you can see here, this is a, a Darth Maul, which obviously is a, a pretty uh, sort of a, it's a substantial challenge for people who are new to this. I wouldn't recommend starting on Maul. One of the benefits, however, is that you get multiple limbs. So if you make a mistake, you can just pick a different pose, which I've done. What you can see here is I've hollowed out the end of the lightsaber. I've actually cut the lightsaber and I think it was into four bits. So we've got the, the tip, we've got the shaft, the hand, and the same the other side as well. You can also notice that I've actually gone through, it's very weak. Uh, let me see if I can get that focused there. I've actually um, gone through the plastic a little bit, but that won't matter um, too much. When you paint it up, you probably won't even see it. It's a case of then threading the LEDs through here. And then what you need to do is you need to pull them so the LEDs are slightly flush with the end here. You want to get them as flush as possible, but you want them also to be perpendicular with the surface of the lightsaber this end so we get the maximum amount of light. The final thing you would need to do is to take one of your acrylic rods, cut it to size and use a little dab of super glue to apply it to the end like this. There we go. This, they, they can fall off. If they do, all you need to do is just clean up the end of the acrylic rod because super glue is somewhat opaque. It can get a cloudy finish to it um, and then basically stick it back. Less is more with super glue. The less you use, the more successful you're going to be. Wonderful, so that's everything there. Like I said, this is just a quick summary video showing you all the tips and techniques that I use. And um, if you are able to get sort of some cool models on your table, then please go ahead and put some photographs on the On The Table Facebook group. We'd love to see your conversions, um, love to see your sort of LED modifications. And if you need any help, you can go to the group there and I'll be delighted to answer any questions. Thank you very much and may the force be with you. Simon, thanks so much for taking the time to demystify and break down how you actually make LED lightsabers. I actually always wondered about that. And so now it seems like it's much more attainable. I'm gonna follow in your footsteps and maybe make my own. And we'll see if uh, the, the apprentice will someday become the master here. Well, I don't know about that, Chase, <laughs> but please don't disappoint me. See what you can do, okay? For the last time. <laughs> uh, so for the next episode coming up, we've got some really cool things in the works. So we're going to have Kevin from Three Men in a War Games come on to talk about dead games. And uh, Simon, what do we mean by dead games? Well, typically it's unsupported games, games which maybe are not directly supported by the manufacturer, but there's tremendous, there's a wealth of content and some of these games you can pick up very reasonably as well. So we're just going to look into some of the projects which have from past years. And we're going to especially pick his brain about the other side, but... If you're in our Facebook community, if you're in our Facebook group, make sure you comment on our show posting uh, with suggestions on other unsupported games that you'd like to see covered. And uh, let us see some of your miniatures from those games as well to kind of inspire us for that segment. In addition to that, let's, let's take a look at some Kickstarters. There's a lot of options out there. And so, Simon, how about maybe doing a Kickstarter roundup? Yep, I think I spend most of my week looking at Kickstarter, <laughs> so I'm sure we've got a lot to talk about. It's, it's, a, dangerous, it's a dangerous thing. We've got to be careful of here. It's a hobby into itself. 
So thank you guys so much for listening and be sure to like and subscribe, leave a comment below and then find us at our newly created On The Table Gaming Facebook group and jump on in there and start sharing your ideas with everybody and helping us build an, a great community here. Fantastic. Look forward to next week, Chase. And in the meantime, hope you get your miniatures on the table.